think you're ready to start. Okay. Um, so welcome everybody in the room and online to this panel discussion and uh, toolkit launch. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Maria Adriana Dejana. I am a chemist colleague and co-conspirator in uh, the creation of the center. Um, you may be familiar with uh, the Center for Gender in Politics at Queens, which we founded in uh, 2019. And essentially, the, the center aims to bridge and build the community between uh, researchers, activists, uh, students, and policymakers interested in having a gender perspective in global politics, as well as in the dynamics that we observe in everyday life. Um, we prioritize initiatives and research that support connections of, uh, across different uh, spheres. Um, and we pr also prioritize connections with um, activists and policymakers. And I think that today's event very much speak to uh, one of our uh, key principles that inspires our mission. Um, one of the key research themes at the center uh, falls under the banner of feminist and queer approaches to peace and security. And we have two major projects under this framework. Um, the first project is the one that we launched today, uh, which is a cooperation between uh, Jenny Hagen, um, the uh, Columbia Diversa and Christian Haidt, and I'm going to introduce our speaker in a minute, and is a, a project that aims to um, develop an approach to queering uh, women, peace and security. And we're looking forward to hear findings from this research. And there is also a second project, which I co-led with my colleague, Heidi Riley, who I think is connected online. And this is a project um, that looks at innovations in peace mediation from a feminist and intersectional perspective. We are also going to be launching a toolkit. Uh, so watch this space. This is going to happen in uh, in March and April next year. But without further ado, um, today is the launch of the Queering Women, Peace and Security Agenda, a practice-based toolkit. Is, uh, we are very much looking forward to hear um, the findings from, from these um, set of brilliant <laughs> researchers, activists, and speakers. And um, I'm also very happy to welcome Yona Honahan, who is going to start our proceedings uh, with um, talking about the, the meanings of WPS from the of Northern Ireland. And I'm also going to introduce briefly our speakers. Um, next to Yona, we have Dr. Anupama Ranawana. Yes, uh, and, and I hope I, I pronounce your name OK. Um, from Christian Hague UK, uh, you've been a key researcher and uh, at the forefront of this project. Uh, next, we have Maria Susana Peralta Ramon from Colombia Diversa, lawyer and writer and um, amazing <laughs> contributor. And then, of course, we have Jamie Hagen, uh, who is the co-director of the center, as well as our peer colleague here. OK, um, we look forward to the conversation and we look forward to having questions both uh, from the audience here and online. And yeah, Jonna, would you like to kick us off with some reflections on WPS and Northern Ireland? Thank you so much for inv inviting me and, and delighted to be here. So my name is Jonna Monahan. I'm director of Women's Platform. We're a very small organization. Basically, I'm the only staff member. But the simplest way to explain who we are is we act as the link between the women's sector in Northern Ireland and the European and international level. So we were originally set up to act as the link to the European Women's Lobby, which is the biggest network of women's organizations across Europe. But over, over time, more of our work has become focused on international human rights frameworks. We have consulted the stat status with the UN. And it was through, through that and through participation in the UN Commission on the Status of Women, that Women's Platform became aware of the Women, Peace and Security agenda not long after the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 was signed. And you know, we absolutely do not claim ownership 
of it because I think the first thing to say is that most of the work that is done in Northern Ireland and I think in most other contexts on community development and engaging women and so on does link to the principles of women, peace and security. But uh, we kind of have a coordinating role and uh, we act as the secretariat in the Northern Ireland Assembly. There's actually an all party group on women, peace and security. So it would be the equivalent to the all party parliamentary groups in Westminster for those who are fa familiar with those. So it's just politicians interested in those issues and it's about sh sharing capacity and building. And they have been actually, you know, it's the discussion always is what is women, peace and security? You know, and for a, a long, I've been in this role for five years. And when I came in, it was very much about, well, is it very much about peace building itself and women about peace building? But actually the way we would look at it is that it's about women at all tables at all times. And that's something that I think certainly in Northern Ireland, there's a very long way to go yet. You know, women would have been part of negotiating the Good Friday Agreement. But if you go to a lot of communities, you know, people and talk to women there uh, and say, well, what about now? They will, they will tell you, you know, we don't see any, we don't see any change. You know, women still are not being listened to. You know, women are not represented at, in public appointments and, and so on. And even though there's more women MLAs, that doesn't mean that gender equality is a priority. It's absolutely is not. And the first thing I should say as well, I think, you know, today's discussion is very welcome. And again, Sophie is here from here and I and the, Ray, and the Rainbow Project have done work on this. But it's something, that, you know, that we very much need to look at, you know, how do we transform the conversation and what, and what is the language and how do we include everyone? Because, you know, for me, certainly, you know, the Good Friday marked 25 years this spring, and there was very much about two communities. Northern Ireland, if it ever was two communities, it certainly isn't now. And I think that's the discussions that we need to have. So we did a, a project to mark the 20th anniversary of 1325 with women across Northern Ireland. It was very much asking, I have a few copies of, of this with me, asking women, if Northern Ireland worked for women, what would it look like? And we asked that question because that's the conversation I had with Jamie that these are not easy terms. The word peace is contested in Northern Ireland. The word security is very much contested in Northern Ireland. So if you put those terms in front of people, at worst case scenario is people shut down. But in any case, it, it narrows the conversation. So that was the question we asked. And we, worked, we talked to women from all backgrounds, rural, urban, disadvantaged young women, women from a number of diverse backgrounds. And basically all women told us the same thing. Nobody's listening to us. Stop asking us, go and make someone listen to us. And the discussions were very much about, you know, and this I think is where, where we need to look at, you know, how do we talk about these things? Because peace did come up and uh, women talked about their experiences of the conflict and the legacy or the conflict, but really what they were talking about, we need a society that works. You know, the issues are the issues are the, are the issues. We need childcare, we need women to be able to make their own choices, proper genuine choices about how to live their lives. You know, anything from when to have children, whether to work, you know, how, care and childcare are huge issues. Healthcare is abysmal in Northern Ireland at the minute and inclusive societies, so societies that work for disabled people. And I think that's the work we have, we need to, to build on because it, the concept of women, peace and security, it works very well at UN level, at the academic level, even at decision maker level, but at grassroots, you know, we all do this work. I think in Northern Ireland as well, a lot of workers, if you said, if you told them you're doing peace building work, they would go, no, that's nothing to do with me. And it's about what do we mean by peace? What is actually a peaceful society? And I think, you know, I, I could go on for a, for a very long time because there was so much in what, what women told us. But essentially, a peaceful society is one 
that works for everyone and that is willing to include everyone and that's something that we're never very clear about that there's space for everyone we yeah. just need people to listen to us <laughs> thank you very much and i'm sure um a lot of these questions will be addressed by our speakers and have been certainly discussed in the toolkit jamie would you like to move here so that um and i'm gonna <laughs> out of the way I don't know. Um, yeah, so it was really um, helpful, I think, for us to be grounded in, you know, what WPS actually means for folks like on the day to day, right, in terms of the people that we're working with. Um, I thought it would be interesting to start um, with each of us reflecting why we wanted to do this project together. Um, and Anu, I'm going to throw it to you first because you approached me to do this, which is really exciting. <laughs> um, you know, I've been working on querying WPS stuff for about a decade, and um, this collaboration um, was a real opportunity to um, think more about what it looks like moving from like writing an academic article into practice. So yeah. I, I want to hear. <laughs> like, um, well, I mean, of course, everything starts with funding. There was an, a fantastic opportunity with the British Academy um, um, to bring together, I think, different sorts of actors working together in a kind of multidisciplinary way. And I've been a, long been a fan of Jamie's work, um, both of us working on the peripheries of IR, if, if we can say that. Um, and um, I've worked, uh, I work for Christian Aid as a research specialist, but I've also worked on different um, transitional justice pieces of research. And I think one of the things that's always missing, really, one is the fact that there's always a lack of a diversity of voices, not just in terms of, I mean, representative politics, but creating those dialogue spaces um, and really centering the lived experience. Um, and I think that's something that's very, very, very strong in the work that, that Jamie does on, on querying. Um, peace and security. Um, and in, at Christian Aid, we have a strong thematic focus, uh, which was called Violence and Peace. It's now called Peace and Peace Building and Security. I'm going to get that wrong, sorry. Um, <laughs> and one of the conversations that started happening there was about what is gender justice and how do we understand mm -hmm. gender justice? And this seemed like a fantastic opportunity to, to say, we're asking this question. There's, there's a research specialism that's also continuing to ask this question. And Columbia, and, and Columbia Diversa is a partner of Christian Aid, but had also a long-standing relationship with uh, Jamie's work. And so it felt like a way to bring together a consortium of different expertise um, <laughs> to work together. So, and it's, it's, it's also great to work like this in this kind of queer feminist collaboration. It was really exciting to do that as well. I agree. Uh, it's been an honor to be part of this conversation and part of this consortium. First, I, I would just say very briefly that Colombia Diversa is Fun. a Colombian NGO. <laughs> you will disappear in the streaming, I believe. <laughs> uh, now you're a vampire, which makes it even more lesbian. <laughs> That's what they teach us at literature school. Uh, vampires and lesbians. Well, um, Colombia Diversa is a Colombian NGO. We do work around LGBTQ human rights since 2004. Back then, the legal framework in my country was terrible. Even though we had a really comprehensive national constitution, it was not very good for the queers, for us, the queers. So we were trying to achieve better legal standards and legal promises by either the Congress or the Constitutional Court. In the end, that ended up working. By 2016, I would say, is the landmark of complete legal framework equality in Colombia. We have a very comprehensive and promising legal framework in my country. We do not have any sort of legal discrimination. And that happened very quickly. In less than 20 years, we went from being a homosexual was a disciplinary action uh, for public professors, for example, to discriminating a person because of their sexual orientation and gender identity is a crime. So that transition, that legal transition happened in less than 20 years. 
I'm not saying, again, as Jonah was saying, that this is all because of Colin Davis's work. We were there, but it is. <laughs> but, but everyone uh, in the Colombian society and in the legal Colombian sphere was working towards this. Um, but the implementation of that legal promise has taken a lot of time. And even though we have a fantastic framework, we don't have a fantastic implementation. Of course, it helps to have good legislation and good judicial decisions, but it is not enough. And also this was regarding peaceful context, no? There was never uh, a specific line of work regarding LGBTQ persons in the Colombian armed conflict, which was weird because Colombia is obsessed with conflict and peace building efforts and producing knowledge about war and peace. And particularly about a gendered approach. The feminist movement is very strong in Colombia. They've been leading the academic work on peace and war efforts for more than 30 years. So it didn't make any sense. <laughs> and by 2012, we realized that. And we started participating in the peace talks, Colombia Universa directly between the guerrilla and the Colombian state, and how the gender approach that the feminist movement was trying to adhere in the final peace accord would include or not the LGBTQ persons. Um, we managed to build a strong alliance with the feminist movement. I think we're going to talk about that more a little bit later on. And that has been perhaps the best decision that we've ever made as an organization and as part of the social movement that tries to make a better society with peace building and art and memory at the center of it. Um, so why we're doing this? We don't do this in Colombia Universa because we believe LGBTQ persons are worthy of this identity politics lottery ticket of entering the benefits of whatever prioritization process is happening. We do this because we believe human experiences are way more complex and can be broadened and therefore enriched if you talk more deeply about gender and sexuality. This is helpful, not only for queer people, but for everyone. We represent a bunch of cases of people who are, for example, children of LGBTQ persons or partners of, for example, a male partner of a trans woman. So he's a cisgender straight man, but he is also victim of discrimination against LGBTQ persons because he's perceived as a gay man, because trans women are perceived as men dressing as women. Um, so that is why we do this. And Colombia, we're going to talk about this more later on, I guess, also faced an incredible opportunity almost two years ago when we started this romance, this <laughs> institutional romance, um, when the feminist movement said, this is enough. We had been waiting for 20 years since the 1325 resolution was accepted by the country of Colombia, but no NAP was ever even thought of. And we said, this is enough. Uh, since we had become friends, particularly during the, feminist, during the final peace accord talk, uh, they brought us in the conversation for the NAP. And we started pushing and pushing with the last national government that was a very conservative one. And we said, this is enough. Let's try and get a better national government and let's get this NAP moving. And that is what we did. And that is when we met and we started talking about how to do this properly from what the academia had learned, what other NAPs could teach us, and what the feminist and LGBTQ social movement had done by then regarding peace building efforts, which again, as Jonah just said, most of them didn't even realize that they had been doing almost exclusively peace building actions in their work. So that's what we do. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I think. Um, it, yeah, and the conversations I've had in Northern Ireland and with folks in Colombia, this is, um, I, I think it is across feminist and LGBTQ organizations that this direct services to improve people's day-to-day -day life, which is, you know, everyday peace, isn't necessarily seen as part of peace building work. But then when you look at the, you know, um, push for localizing women, peace and security and actually having it be uh, something that people can connect with in their day-to-day -day life, <laughs> you end up hearing exactly the things that the people that we're working with and, and learning from are, are doing. So there's this interesting, I'm, I'm really motivated to um, lift up uh, queer and trans 
leaders as experts in, in thinking about peace and um, have those insights be part of the conversation about um, what it is that, you know, what type of peace we're looking for. But also I'll say, so I wrote Queering Women, Peace and Security in 2016, and um, a lot of folks have been interested in it and it's um, not, you know, now I'm being invited to, to you know, give panels in front of, or, sorry, talks in front of um, folks that are often working on a nap, but also, um, you know, in, in various WPS contexts and, and they are, there is a real interest in doing something, right? Um, at the same time, I would also say this connects to some of the work that you and I have done anew that um, I have a real, um, as, as a slow scholar on some level, I have a real resistance to just doing something. <laughs> and so I, I saw this working on this toolkit as a way to intervene and um, partially, you know, partially doing the work of like lifting up experts, but also um, you're not starting from scratch. If you're doing, wanting to do something on queering women, peace and security, if this is something that folks are learning about, well, how, how can um, they learn from and link into ongoing work, um, which exactly as we've laid out is quite challenging when those people doing that work don't necessarily even know what WPS is, right? There's that. Um, and then, you know, part of the approach to the toolkit is um, anti-militaristic and, and this having a specific, explicitly feminist commitment. Um, that is not going to be the case with a lot of WPS work. <laughs> and so um, we, I, I will just say that the three main parts of, of the toolkit are first thinking about how we queer the four different pillars of women, peace and security. Um, I think this, the second part about, is about opportunities and challenges in, in queer and feminist uh, WPS collaboration, which I'd be really interested to, to turn to to talk about a bit more. And then you cannot have a toolkit, at least at this stage in the game, on anything WPS, but certainly querying WPS without having a section on national action plans, because that is the, that is, that does tend to be what's funded and it is what is seen as doing WPS. Um, but um, I wonder if we could speak a bit about maybe the October workshop and sort of how this more conversation about the feminist and queer collaborations, which um, was is illuminating. <laughs> yes. Yeah, for sure. I can start. Well, we said when we said to do this toolkit, uh, the first thing we thought was, who are we going to do it with? I mean, we are not the audience we want to affect. Then who are we going to talk to? Which feminist is going to sit with us and <laughs> talk about this with their very crowded agenda? And even if they, are, they have very good intentions, sometimes they don't know how to queer stuff. Because we'll, I think we'll talk about that later on. What it means, uh, what we mean at least when we say queering is not just sitting LGBTQ persons or LGBTQ persons in the room, but sort of shaking the foundations and the definitions of central concepts of what of the work we're doing. Um, so who was going to talk to us? We knew who were not going to talk to us. So we eliminated those pretty quickly, of course, anti-rights uh, organizations, which are not that numerous in Colombia. I have to say, I have to proudly say that those feminist organizations that don't recognize trans women are we as women uh, or things like that, they're not that many. So that was an easy elimination process and we didn't lose many players. But then who we thought that could talk to us were feminist organizations that were already doing peace building work and that were already allies with Colombia Diversa in other works. For example, representing victims before the transitional court or doing some follow-up process on the implementation of the gender approach of the peace accord. Since we agreed on the meaning of that gender approach that it included LGBTQ persons, we have an alliance for doing follow-up on that approach implementation. So we had those, but then we thought of those feminists that we had never worked with, which didn't do specific peace building efforts. They were focused on gender and reproductive rights. We didn't know them because Columbia Universal had never done work with them, but we said, let's try. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> 
Um, <clears throat> so we sat with the transitional justice feminists and with the abortion feminists, to say it shortly, uh, in a workshop last October. And we said, well, what are your questions about this? If, if you wanted to do more work with lesbian, bisexual, trans, and queer women, what is it that you need? What is it that you don't know? Or what is it that has you on the fence about whether to do it or not, whether wanting it or not? Uh, and we found very interesting uh, fields, I have to say. There was like a personal and um, human emotion that at first we sort of imagined they would be there, but I think that day I understood why they were there. This idea of the erasure of women, when it came from my strong allies, it just didn't resonate the same way it used to when I heard it on the news with TERFs saying it. This was something personal that I could connect to. And this was mostly, to put it in a, like a cartoony case, it was uh, feminist, feminist women who were themselves lesbian or bisexual women afraid that their ally was calling them out on leaving me, for example, a lesbian woman outside of their, of their scope of their work. They were sort of offended but not in a tricky way but in a way of I can't believe I've done this to my friend like how can that happen and to people like me myself a bisexual woman who has done this work for 30 years and that day we gathered that information and that was I think very humane and led us to a more comprehensive understanding of what is the kind of conversation we want to have so first we understood that they were thinking about just sitting LGBTQ women in the room, that that was the meaning of queering. So that was, uh, well, that's an important finding because that is not the definition of queering as I just told you. And we also figured out that we had to, and this is not un, like undermining their claim, but we sort of had to um, calm down their worries about the erasure of their work, of their legacy, and make more emphasis on the idea that what we wanted to do was to build on top of their work, that they had done a bunch of work that is very important, relevant, and central for the things we wanted to do, but now we needed to move a little, like, a little step forward. And to be able to manage those human emotions, those human emotions was uh, tricky, but it was very good to find because most of their, uh, restrictions or differences with this work was mostly because they thought that if they agreed to this, then they were erasing their previous 20 or 30 years of work. Uh, so we had to navigate and show them how that is not the case, of course, and that opened a lot of doors and a lot of conversations. And finally, what we found as well was that uh, the abortion feminists, they were very open to talk about this, like very straightforward, let's go and do it, which I didn't think would happen because as I told you, we didn't know them, we hadn't worked with them. I thought they were gonna be very <clears throat> like woman-centered and why does this matter? Well, of course, because what they wanna do is better everything for everyone, like healthcare issues, security issues. They had done literally in-person work with, for example, urgent abortion cases that needed specific and trained healthcare professionals that were not there because of the structural discrimination uh, legacy is that doctors who practice abortions are less doctors, yeah? So they understood very well how one stigma can harm a whole system that is trying to take care of all of us, like a healthcare system. Um, so we found that alliance and we were able to just like hook them up on our agenda. And I would say that, I would just highlight that understanding the emotions of those allies that wanted to include our work in their work, but didn't know how to do it and had never felt safe before to ask those questions was for me the most eye-opening moment of that event. Um, that's what I would say. Great, thanks. Thank you, um, Susan. And what Susan has really pointed out really well is the importance of the dialogic spaces um, that were part of not, not not only this this project, but I think that are that that are occurring. Particularly, I think um, in the workshop that we had that we had in in October, 
2022 feels a long, long time ago. <laughs> um, what, uh, what was fantastic was uh, the, the structure that I loved for question and response um, and, and like the discussion of minutia on particular terminologies and, and, and to, I think to have the courage to have asked uncomfortable questions and to, and to respond together and learn together. I think that was really very, very important. Um, and that's, that's a lot of what I think we see coming through, um, we hope, in the toolkit um, in particular, is that what's, what's coming out of these conversations, what's coming out of the dy dynamism of these conversations. And something else that, that you said that I think is very, very key is that it is what, what, what really is, is at the heart of the responses from the different communities is also, I think, an avowed anti-militaristic um, stance, right? Be the the a militaristic a securitized stance, if you will, is what creates these stigmas. It's what silences, deliberately silences, and deliberately violates and exploits um, uh, bodies, different bodies, you know. And if we take that stance of an anti-militaristic stance, that is essentially querying the entire security and securitization agenda and saying. What purpose does does this have if all it does is to create and perpetuate violence, right? And so I think that's that's this really large and fantastic um, challenge that's thrown out of these conversations, not just the conversations, but out of the the, the sort of alliance that's that's forming there. And I think I think we'll talk about this a bit later, but this it also kind of points to the importance of coalition building mm -hmm. and how coalition building can occur. And lastly, the fact that we say this, I think about three times in the toolkit. Um, I think so, I don't know, because it, it, it's in my head, um, uh, is, is, is that this is about violence in the everyday, everyday people's lives, not the kind of high level of, 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 of a conflict, but what happens in the everyday, in the quotidian aspects uh, of, of someone's life or a community's life. Um, and after that, what happened to you, Jamie? <laughs> yeah, well, but th that's and that's exactly it because there's the uh, lack of data. There's the um, in terms of you know how do you create WPS with with you know those with like a WPS mandate. There is um, I, you know I continue to be faced with you know sort of what I think are wild claims that mm -hmm. some people actually don't believe that there's LGBTQ people in some of the contexts where they're working, or don't think that there's like queer women who have accessed the services that they're offering for WPS, which is just factually inaccurate, right? Just because we don't have the information about it, we can say with confidence, there are queer women who are at WPS <laughs> programs, <laughs> absolutely, right? Everyone has a sexual orientation, a gender identity. Um, and also just because you haven't, and, and, and part, of, part of this like coalition building is, um, how can it not just be up to the um, underfunded, yeah. always trying to just, you know, make it to the next, <laughs> um, you know, through the next couple of months organization to do the work of querying? How, like, what does it mean to have this collaborative commitment? And, and so something that was, is really challenging is shifting power dynamics within a really marginalized space. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and so, and that, that's also why I, when I'm saying like lifting up queer and trans leaders and just people who've already been doing the work for 10 plus 15 years, um, there, we, we end up seeing racism, classism, sexism <laughs> um, within the civil society spaces that, um, are choosing who's on panels and are choosing who you're interviewing as an expert and 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 um, like reproducing this idea of um, queer as um, less than mm -hmm. and yeah. um, not as yeah. progressed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. right? And um, so part of the workshop was bringing in people who are absolutely leaders and experts. I mean, I, I do believe that like, you know, if you're a poor person living your life, you're an expert to like speak to like what piece is for you, absolutely. But people who literally like have, you know, been in these spaces of talking about peace building have, are very aware of the, the infrastructure of, um, you know, the peace building um, uh, 
the national action and all of that and and having to reassert the ex the expertise <laughs> on, a, on a continual basis and this is from feminists this is from feminists and so um there's definitely um with with tony hastrup I've, I've been writing about this like high in hierarchies of knowledge and very much doing that with which I think leads us to the next line of questioning that we had in mind about how to actually queer the nap. So what we did during this October toolkit was also the October workshop for the toolkit, uh, was we brought uh, these feminist friends and these feminist soon to be friends, but we also brought over four or five lesbian, bisexual, lesbian, bisexual and trans um, female activists from all over Colombia. They were not what you would usually call like either an academic or one of these other feminists that we had in the room that had been doing WPS work for 30 plus years. They were grassroots organizations, directors, the only staff member uh, or the only volunteer person in their um, hometowns doing this kind of work. And we were able to bridge a conversation that had never occurred because these feminist allies and soon to be allies had a, a very broad nationwide kind of inside look of what the human rights situation looked like for uh, women and girls. 
But since they don't do local work with LGBTQ organizations, they didn't have that intersection intersectionality space seen. So they didn't know the gaps their work had. And once this um, LGBTQ activist showed it to them, then this uh, personal emotion that I was talking about just kind of, I, I'm not going to say that it didn't matter anymore, but it was processed in a better manner because it was evident then that their work could be improved and it could make this little person sitting in front of you uh, life so much easier. And they forgot also, uh, even though some of these like more socially powerful feminists uh, they were themselves lesbian or bisexual women, they had forgotten by now what it was to be a lesbian or bisexual woman when you were impoverished or where you were when you were not living in the capital city or when you didn't have a salary for the activist work that you were doing. They had forgotten that because, of course, doing 30 years of work by being a lawyer as a gender woman uh, that is read as white in the Colombian society, well, it gives you a bunch of privilege that these LGBTQ activists didn't have. And I think that bringing those two realities together also made our work a little bit easier because we also, white woman that was living in the capital, that was also a professional, it seemed like a conversation that nobody would hear, no? But their expertise also about the intersectionality efforts that had to be done um, brought a new, a new tone to the conversation. And also just to emphasize on what Jamie said, but I think it was definitely one of the biggest findings of that workshop was we have a lot of common ground that we know and that we use, but that we never mention. For example, the anti-militaristic approach. I mean, the queer and the women and girls hate, both hate because they're victims of the armies, the police, uh, the popular election politicians, like we have a bunch of common enemies. <laughs> and again, this just to emphasize what I said in the beginning, this is not because we are the lucky winners of a sad competition, but because patriarchy works that way. When you disobey gender and sexuality norms, you get, well, affected <laughs> to use a proper term. I'm not going to use bad words today. Um, you get affected and you get discriminated and you lose even when you're playing by the rules, no? So women, girls and LGBTQ persons had, have a bunch of that common ground uh, that they still need to name and say out loud just to remember that we are all in the same space and in the same ship uh, trying to take down the patriarchy. And just to end on an opportunity but also an obstacle and also how to queer it, I also think that the LGBTQ social movement has to take responsibility and face the music of its long-standing patriarchal practices. At least in Colombia, we have, perhaps Colombia is the only one with a female uh, executive, executive director, which is not me. People make that mistake <laughs> often and you're gonna get me fired. It's my boss, Marcela. <laughs> Quoted in the talk, okay? <laughs> Um, she is, uh, I think it's the only LGBTQ organization run by a woman um, in Colombia. And we, it's not that we have that many organizations, but out of the 10 or 15 big LGBTQ organizations, how is it that only one is run by a woman? That makes no sense. Uh, and also, I would say that Colombia is the only LGBTQ organization in Colombia that presents itself and are based to feminist standards. We try to include feminist, um, both academically and pragmatically approaches to everything we do. We try to create alliances with other feminists, <laughs> like <laughs> such and such. <laughs> and that is something that other LGBTQ organizations just don't care about. And I think that is the effect of the lottery ticket, uh, sad contest uh, speech. If we're both running for the same sad lottery ticket, what I need to do is just get there first and get you out of the way. But if we remember that we're just doing some uh, group work 
on improving everyone's lives, then bringing you in is perhaps the most intelligent move. No, so I would just say that that is something that it is not like only the feminists have to change mm -hmm. uh, their emotions and their approach. Also, the LGBTQ movement has a lot of work to do, bringing up their feminist volume, at least in Colombia. Brilliant. Sorry. <laughs> I could listen to Susanna, <laughs> sit at her feet and I listen. Um, I just wanted to, to, to also talk about, I think this this point about expertise is very important. What Jamie said, what Susanna has said as well, um, in, in, in many, many ways, particularly this idea that, um, and this is, I'm going to, I think I'll take my Krishna hat off for this because it's a critique of the international development sphere here, is that there is an understanding of who is recognized as an expert, right? Even when you have someone who kind of represents, um, how has how has that person got to there? It's because there are certain structured pathways that make someone recognize them as an expert. So your lived experience doesn't make you an expert in the eyes of you know whoever it is, and that's something that we really need to disrupt. And that's why I really like what Jamie, Jamie talks about, like lifting up, you know, um, queer and trans leaders and saying some your lived experience makes you an expert. And we really need to be, I think, not just embracing that, but saying that is that is part of the praxis of the work that we do, right? You don't have to have your PhD from the LSE or Oxford or Cambridge and have done 30 years of activism and have your law degree and have worked for all the correct organizations to become the independent expert somewhere. So this is, I think, one of the things in terms of queering um, the, uh, in, in this case, the Women, Peace and Security agenda is to also query what are the pathways that make someone an expert and display and silences someone else's expertise. So that's a really key, I think, question that, that we should be picking up and, and talking through. And I'll take ownership of it as someone working for an INGO, that that's <laughs> something we need to be doing as well. Jim. Yeah, and I'll say that one of the, the opportunities, challenges of, of the of the workshop and of the forum the, mm -hmm. the, that maybe you could speak about is, OK, so querying the pillars, um, protection, prevention, participation, relief and recovery of women, peace and security. Um, yes, it's about how do you think about how LGBTQ people, um, what does it mean to think about the participation of LGBTQ people, but it's also Who's participating? Where are you organizing events? Why are you, or do you even want to work on a nap? That's the type of questions that I find queer and feminist organizations. And certainly we could speak in the Northern Ireland context. Maybe you stop doing consultations at a certain point if it's consuming so much of your time and not actually leading to meaningful change when you're actually writing something like a feminist recovery plan, which is probably, you know, as Catherine O'Rourke has written about, uh, the closest thing to a nap in Northern Ireland that, that we kind of already have. And so I think part of, it, you know, there's there's some frequently asked questions that I put in here, that, that we put in here as part of like what often comes up and what can we do um, to queer. But I think it's also, there are, so, you know, there, there's concrete recommendations that um, are already on the table, right? And yes. um, I think part of, yeah, part of doing this work is thinking, it is really amazing to see how quickly the reproduction of the model of like what a nap is and what WPS can be gets so marginal. It gets so, yeah. it gets not, it just becomes so small. And I think finding ways to have these conversations against, you know, because there's certainly the question when I started doing Korean WPS work, there was a question about like, what if LGBTQ organizations want nothing to do with WPS, <laughs> right? Which is a legitimate question. Um, and I hold that, you know, at the same time that there are, you know, now, Recommend very clear, concrete recommendations from from some organizations in NAPS and um, in the forum that we'll that we'll hear about. Um, so, 
yeah, I think this constant tension of queering as um, undoing and mm -hmm. maybe maybe doing less, maybe speaking less, maybe inviting different people in, um, but also listening, right? Yeah. So the listening is is a, is a doing as well. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think um, the other the, the last thing I'll say before maybe we hear from both of you and then open it up to Q&A, but like, I, I was really struck by this idea of moving uh, from individual to collective security, which is something that really resonates, especially thinking about mutual aid, thinking about um, the COVID-19 crisis and thinking about how communities uh, in, in many instances uh, really did have to rely collectively on finding everyday security and, and ways through um, crisis. Um, it, it actually quite immediately becomes concrete recommendations about what's not working. And it, it's not, uh, and uh, I don't know, maybe maybe Susanna, that, that was what, you get three people standing together for like 15 minutes and all of a sudden it's like, oh, here's 15 very concrete recommendations based on our lived experience about what is not working about this like multi-million dollar security response <laughs> to, to insecurity in, in my own community. I mean, that, that I, I thought that was quite, Compelling. <laughs> yes, yes, we did that. That happened uh, June this year. So that's like three months ago only. After we, in October, decided what the diagnostic was of what the feminist movement needed, what these LGBTQ leaders didn't understand or didn't want, or, and what we could bring into that conversation, we said, well, apparently what we need is to talk to more LGBTQ leaders with this particular set of questions, worries, concerns, and look for concrete recommendations. That happened on the line of this project. But then on the other hand, as I told you, and I think I have to make this point now before time runs out, uh, Colombia elected a new national government in August of last year, which is the first national government that identifies as a left-wing uh, political force. And they had promised since the elections campaign that they would push and work on the first national action plan of the 1325 resolution in Colombia. So as I told you, the whole feminist movement was vibing with this. So uh, luckily that was uh, the couple, like the president and the vice president, that was the pair that was elected. And the vice president, Francia Marquez, she insisted on fulfilling that promise on the WPS uh, and the NAP, the creation of the NAP. And part of that promise was it is not going to be drafted, written, and just tried to be implemented from the center, from the white, powerful, cis, straight center of the country. We're going to try and make it different. Uh, so they did, they are just finishing with the, with a bunch of consultations uh, and one of those was consultation with lesbian, bisexual, transgender and queer women. Colombia was, was there. Since we had some resources from this project and others and since we are the only LGBT organization working on WPS issues in Colombia, which resonates with what you just said, um, well, of course, we were meant to be there and meant to participate and sort of take the lead on this. And we, what we did was we're not going to just preach about what we already know. What we're going to do is gather the feminist questions, gather the LGBTQ leaders' expertise, and gather the national opportunity for consultation. And we're just going to sit them all in a room for one and a half days, divide it, split them into small groups like uh, and ask them questions and then each group is in charge of a pillar and then inside each pillar they're in charge of a specific and concrete measure and with that measure they're in charge of imagining it how that could be implemented so it was a long way we went from hello uh, we've never met but i know that you're a lesbian woman who does some sort of human rights work in whatever town in colombia would you like to come do a consultation on the NAP for WPS in <laughs> Colombia? And they were like, I don't know who you are. I don't know what that is. Why do I care? So the first step was, of course, making them, well, convincing them that this was relevant, relevant two or three days of their lives, making also promises about that the national government was not just going to receive their promises and toss them in the bin. 
and also making sure that the methodology made sense. Because if we kept on just doing random consultation, like raise the hand, whoever has an idea about peace, like we were not gonna get anything. So we had to sit them down and ask very concrete questions. There was like a secret <laughs> uh, informant on each group trying to keep the conversation to the right track. Because of course we have such difficult lives that we could just go on and on about like sad stuff that's happened to all of us. Um, but we needed concrete measures <laughs> for the NAP and for this work. Uh, so how to use and understand that, again, that human emotion and those lived experiences as expertise, but to take them to a new place of proposing a concrete measure that made sense for a NAP. Um, so that's what we did for a day and a half with almost 25 LBTQ leaders in Colombia. Uh, we invited some government officials and we said that's your spot you sit there and you watch we didn't let them talk we didn't let them do anything or decide anything uh, and they learned a lot and the end of this was uh, an initiative that we're gonna publish september 27 which is in like a week mm -hmm. with the with these concrete measures and how we came with the method how the methodology came to be and how um, there's these broad suggestions of ending the patriarchy but also very concrete measures. If there's this public policy about human rights defenders, for example, access to security issues, consider making it more collective because LB, because queer people protect themselves uh, better when it's a group or a collective approach than when it's an individual with a security or a bodyguard or something like that. Like that doesn't work. I would say for anyone, but my concern here is for the queers. Uh, and we have these very concrete measures and that's helped us. Uh, and I think that's gonna end up being perhaps the first NAP in the world with such concrete measures for lesbian, bisexual, trans and queer women that, it, that actually has some implementation that has been overseen. So this is not just like end the patriarchy, but very concrete uh, measures. We were also talking that these sets a higher standard for, for other national governments about sometimes all you need is the political will of doing it. Colombia, as I told you before, had a bunch of information, had a bunch of civil society organizations and civil society movement about peace building, about memory, about security. But the national government never cared enough to ask them and to gather that information. Once we had the window of opportunity, we took it so quickly, it was almost rude. <laughs> but uh, that is all you need. You need someone that has the power to draft the nap to actually care about this. And the information and the expertise, you, you will find it because there's queer people everywhere. So you have that expertise, you have it. All you need is someone powerful enough to do this and take it into the nap to actually listen to you and to take you seriously. So that is what we did. Um, I just want to say that one of the things we found that uh, there was also how alliances between feminists and LGBTQ organizations were easier in smaller contexts than at the national or the international level. It was easier for them to find helpful solutions in the small town of whatever, Tumaco in Colombia, than in the whole country of Colombia, yeah? And I think this speaks, again, to why we're together, not because of the lottery ticket, but because we're facing the same enemy and we're facing the same system that has the same, almost always the same opportunities and obstacles for both of us. There's only one player who is winning this mm -hmm. game and it's n neither of us and neither of a bunch of other people. So we have a lot of common ground that we can exploit. And seeing those local alliances helped the national feminist organizations to see how they can do that work as well. And to see that if their national work includes a bunch of, for example, local field work, then they can use that field work with uh, the LGBTQ organizations that are also there. So instead of going and doing one workshop with your local feminist or women's movement NGO, 
call the queers as well and do that workshop also with them. It's going to take like five more spots in your menu. <laughs> so that's easy. It's easy. It's not that difficult. And seeing that they had already done those alliances, they knew each other, they were friends, they were family members even. Uh, seeing that that had happened at the local level made these national and international um, activists realize that this work is not that hard. This work is not so scientifically from the global north that tries to impose an impossible thing in poor Colombia. Like, no, people are already doing this because they're already trying to survive and to advocate for their own rights and their improvement in their daily lives contexts. Um, so I think that was very um, eye-opening. And I know because we release these uh, frequently asked questions and like particular tips on how to improve this alliance. We released this last week or two weeks ago in Colombia. And when those feminists of the national level, like friends and soon to be friends, found out that we were going to do that, they were calling us like, please let us in. We want to know, we want to find out. And I was like, yes, of course. I mean, I'll, I'll leave the room if you can sit and listen to this. Of course, this is exactly what we wanted. And I think that is a huge um, and unexpected result of querying this peace building efforts can be done and it can be done even in an easier manner if you become friends. <laughs> I have this joke, it's terrible, but it's like, like make the queers and the feminists friends again because that is all we need. And we had been friends in the past. It's just this very recent tragic turn of events that I also think is twisting the notions of feminism, mm. that we shouldn't just like uh, give in to that. We had been friends in the past. We had achieved a lot of um, wins for both of the movements in the past. We can keep doing that. And people are al already doing it when their immediate needs are so urgent. I think when we have some time to lay back and worry about other stuff, we get like fighting amongst each other, amongst us. Uh, but when you need to, I don't know, bring some cop that is doing terrible things to civil society individuals before justice, you'll be friends with the feminists or you'll be friends with the queers because that cop is hitting both of us, like girl, women, girls, women and queers. Um, and when we remember that immediate threat and that immediate need, then the alliance becomes much more evident. And I think that's what we should and what we were striving for in the mm -hmm. first place. Yeah, absolutely. Should, did you want to? No, okay. Uh, well, I think we should open it up to questions. Yeah. I'm curious if, if you have any online, because we do have a Q&A option online, if people would like to add and ask any questions. Any questions um, but yeah, also in the audience, any right. questions? Comments are also welcome. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> um, I was really interested in uh, this idea of how very often we think about the national moving towards the, uh, the, the subnational or the local, and, but what you just described is actually showing that very often knowledge uh, actually travels um, in different ways. And I think this is something that in relation to WPS, I mean, I cannot be, I think we should stress these time and time again. So I just wonder if you have any thoughts on how do we make this uh, inversion of knowledge more visible? <laughs> Is it only happening in Colombia or have you come across other spaces where actually the local is speaking back and the national or the international is listening for once? Mm. I can talk about how we've done it in Colombia or how Colombia has done it. Uh, I don't know if someone else is doing it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but what we've tried to do is to take this expertise seriously, of course, and to sometimes even convince them that they are experts. Mm -hmm. We have gotten re rejections saying, no, I don't want to go. I don't know what WPS is. You are such important and elegant ladies and I'm, I'm not going to sit there in front of you. And, and we've had to come back and again and again and again and saying, 
you are the one expert, like you are the person we need to consult. And that has worked, but also we've done a bunch of leveling up uh, workshops or events. So for example, this day and a half where we constructed the specific measures with the LBTQ leaders, it was actually two days and a half because the first full day was a whole workshop with just the leaders explaining from zero what is WPS? What is the UN Security Council? Why does Colombia has an obligation at an international level to think and do this? Why is it believable that they will take your words and use them in the NAP? What is a NAP? And more importantly, how that thing that is going to be done nationwide is going to impact you locally. What is it that you want to do? So we started, actually, we started the other way around. What is it that you want to do in your activism? at whatever city you live in or town. And then once they told us, for example, I, I always use this example because I have favorites. Okay. Everyone. Uh, and this trans woman, uh, she always insists on a trans parade. This is because of the memory of other contestants in the past of this parade that were killed by the guerrilla. So what they have done as an act of resistance is holding this same parade over and over and over until they don't kill them anymore. Uh, of course, the, the killing stopped a long time ago. Uh, and some people, when she makes this request of funding for the parade, like literally funding for the prize for the runner up, the first princess or whatever, people are like, ah, but that is so void. That makes no sense. They never give her the chance to explain why this is important. So she said, uh, I want money for my parade. And I was like, yes, yes, Camila, yes. But <laughs> you need to give me more information about why. So then, of course, she never gets to tell the whole story. So she is not used to including that in her narrative. So once she spilled all of the beans about why this is important and why it's part of the community building efforts and why this is about democracy in the end, uh, it was evident how I could link her money request, which seemed very void at the beginning, with, for example, um, reparation guarantees you know, or recovery for the recovery pillar, uh, relief and recovery pillar. And once I showed her that, like this, what you're asking is memory building, which is part of the relief and recovery pillar. She was like, I can't believe this. Like, I can't believe such a local need is part of an international agenda. Mm -hmm. Of course, nobody gives her the chance to build that connection ever. And once we allowed that connection to happen and to be tangible for them, it was easier to sit them the next day in a room and build uh, specific measures. So this was not like an exploitation of their knowledge, but more of um, making them realize how they are doing peace building work, even though at the beginning they thought they weren't, and how the national government has an obligation of bringing them in uh, and bringing those efforts as examples and as opportunities to continue the peace building efforts. The other thing that worked for us was, as you know, as I said before, Colombia is obsessed with war and peace. And we're currently starting a new peace process with another guerrilla. And we have a magnificent peace process right now that has been being implemented since 2016. But nothing guarantees that that will be as amazing next time. <laughs> so what we said and what we're trying to do is use the current peace piece as the framework or the minimum baseline for next peace processes. And that is the same thing we're saying with the NAP. The NAP is the framework for whatever peace building initiatives you've got. And that also um, sort of, um, how is it, enfranchised <laughs> uh, this local activist a little bit more. Because they said, like, well, this has a direct impact. Maybe I will also be included in whatever definitions or concerns will be discussed in the upcoming uh, peace process. So it's more about, yes, it is about sh shifting the way knowledge flows, but it's also about shifting the way you make this proposal and you make this question. This is not about how you can give me something that works for my NAP approach or whatever. It's about how my NAP could benefit your local interests. And then from there, you can build 
on more national or international um, measures. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that, that that just links into so much about like the resistance from queer and trans organizations about like progress narratives about mm -hmm. what um, how you know when your community is is safe and succeeding. Which I think this question comes up about you know well okay so Colombia has all, all all these amazing things happen but like how is that relevant to like these other contexts and um, like we've talked about this a fair amount. Uh, because Colombia is being lifted up as like the go-to. I mean, Susan is like on <laughs> all the panels, um, and um, I, because there is like, oh, sh we should do something about LGBTQ people in in peace to some like on a surface like surface curiosity, I would say. Um, but there's. Querying WPS can be happening in the UK and the US in, um, you know, and is happening in, in other contexts. Um, and I think we're using some of the examples here to, to like, okay, there's, there's some concrete practical recommendations and practices that you can learn. Um, I don't even necessarily want to say from because it's also with because so much mm -hmm. of what, every time we're having these conversations is like who else can we get in the room let's continue having these conversations because we know other people are already doing this and and we know that uh we want to we want to continue to make it stronger and, and like have have choices about how it's done and not have to be chasing after um a framing that is not working. I mean, I think I do think there's lots of really fantastic women, peace and security work that's that's happening. But I also think there's a lot of people who are tired of what has become a depoliticized framework. And so um, how, how do we keep queering women, peace and security is something that's anti-militaristic feminist, have those commitments and, and infuse that possibility and unlearning um, in, in these spaces, which I, I can say from hosting, you know, co-hosting a couple of different conversation cafes, like there is, there is a hunger <laughs> for doing this work. Um, and it is, um, it is something that, that there's, there's an opportunity to do uh, more of, um, but I think, you know, we'll, we'll sort of see what I'm, I'm excited to see what the reception is from, from, um, from the, from the toolkit. Um, and I guess I should, do we have any? No, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And from Leon, can you unmute yourself? Leon? Hi. Thank you so much. It's the end of the day for some of us, and I, I really wanted to thank you for your uh, presentation. I can't wait to see the toolkit. Um, my name is Leah McMillan. I'm the director of Global hey, Pro. Can you hear me? I mean, why would that work? <laughs> Are you hearing me twice? That's horrible. It's enough. It's bad enough to hear me once. Can I go ahead? Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm not sure you can hear me. <laughs> Okay, cool. I hear some giving. Um, so thank you. Um, I work with a number of other people. <laughs> I know, I know. If it's okay, well, that's good. I just want to, to point out something really important in the example that Susanna gave, which is um, when we were at the workshop in Bogota, one of the activists I was talking to was 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 telling me how important it was to have uh, Colombia Diversa as a sort of a central national organization playing the part of convener rather than um, implementer and instrument like an instrumentalist kind of way but was convening and gathering and I think this is this is something that is a really key point for uh, say organizations that are at that national level to be to be the convener to be that common ground um, and to have those conversations um, a month ago now, I think uh, we were at the Conversation Cafe in London, and there was again another conversation about how some of the terminology and so on is very isolating. But when you talk about it, you realize, yes, this is the work I'm doing on the ground, right? And that's exactly the point that you're making here, right? And so I think maybe it's also something for this is, you know, I've also worked, at, you know, in like national level CSOs and so on. I think sometimes national level CSOs have a hard time kind of stepping aside and, and taking on 
um, that kind of, you know, convenership role because they also want to be experts or they're seen as experts, right? But if you're if you if you're willing to sort of um, step aside and think more in terms of power together, power with that coalition building aspect is really important, particularly in the in the political scenario we have now, which is increasingly authoritarian, which is increasingly anti-rights, right? Um, not in this project, but another project that I'm doing on civic spaces, we are seeing how governments are able to marginalize smaller um, uh, like uh, CSOs, uh, particularly rural CSOs um, or individual activists, not even allowing them to register their spaces mm -hmm. or working mm -hmm. their spaces. And this is where, if you have a sort of a national level presence, you should be um, saying my, my institutional framework can work for you because you're being, you know, marginalized, mm -hmm. right? So have that. I think I think rethinking the role um, and not just rethinking it, redoing it altogether is really, mm -hmm. really important here, if, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. So in 2006, we signed our comprehensive peace accord. And uh, the, a lot of things are going on, but still, like, not, nothing much for women on this women peace and security agenda. So um, as I was listening to you all, uh, as you mentioned, that it's very hard to shift the power dynamics. I thought that we in Nepal, only we are struggling for this, but like, after hearing you, uh, uh, I, I feel I, I, I relate with you all. I was one of the member of drafting this national action plan on 1325 and 1820, the second national action plan. Though I implemented the first national action plan as a as a local implementer, where the government officials say that 1325 is this the name of the taxi, is the taxi number, or is the registration number? What is this 1325? So we started our work uh, uh, with from that level. So now people know what is 1325 and what is 1820. But now, as as a as a part of this uh, national action plan drafting committee, we were able to uh, like. I was engaged in a lot of regional consultations, and we were able to reach out like 2,000 plus uh, women and, and people from different groups. And I was very sad to see the number of uh, people from LGBT community. Only one people, mm -hmm. more than 2,000 plus consultation. Only one people. We got the the name of that person as as from this LGBT community. Though Nepal is very progressive country, recently we passed a law where uh, same-sex marriage is also uh, and, uh, like legal. But the situation is, is, is very sad. And now I'm working as a mentor of one trans woman. People, people usually say, don't you, like, don't you have the capacity to work with straight women? Why you work with the, mm -hmm. like, trans women and all of the things? So how can we work with the different parts of society so how can, because like working in one section is not enough, like as for my experience, how can we work with the service providers, the service seekers and the government sectors, like how can we engage with them in every sector, that, that's one important thing for me. I hope this toolkit will help me to, to resolve my concerns here. It will, for sure. <laughs> um, well, I can, I can answer from my experience in Colombia, I think what we do, as Anu also said, is not uh, be the population that needs to be addressed. Like Colombia Diversa is not a representation of the LGBTQ persons in Colombia. We work for their human rights, for our human rights. Uh, but it's like if you want to know what happens to the queers in Colombia, you need to go and consult them. It's not some people. Sometimes we get. I think it's because of the name. We say Colombia, it sounds like an official institution. So we get questions like, how many LGBTQ persons are in Colombia? And say, like, I don't know. Ask the Colombian government, I don't know. <laughs> like, but don't you know? Like, well, no. <laughs> like we are in comparison to the size of the country and to the size of the task, a very small organization where there are two or three nationwide organizations, LGBTQ organizations in Colombia, and Colombia is the smallest out of those three. We've got, which considered Johan's staff pretty big, but in comparison <laughs> to the others, pretty small. We're a 25 to 30 people staff organization that pretends to work in a bunch of stuff. <laughs> uh, it's very small in size, uh, so we do not know what the queer people need 
uh, you need to go and consult them. So what we try to do is to be conveners and to try and fill the void of understandings. So 1325 is not a taxing number. It's a number of a resolution of the UN that does this and the Security Council in charge of this other thing. Uh, so we try and with service seekers, we try to provide information of what tools they can use to further advance their own agenda. And with the service providers, what we try and do is uh, abolish some of the myths that they've got in their minds. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they ask us, mm, what should we do as the national government? What should we do to end the eighth, uh, whatever, epidemic, episode, whatever? And it's like, I don't know. <laughs> what do you mean? It's like, well, aren't you the LGBT organization? And it's like, well, that is not all we do. And also, why do you think that HIV and AIDS, it's only an LGBTQ issue. So sort of bringing down those myths that not always come, not always come from hate or discrimination, sometimes come from just culture. That is the culture we were all raised. And since they are not themselves LGBTQ persons, they are not experts. <laughs> so they believe all that they have seen. Like, like the queers are gay white men that live in apartments in the cities with uh, small dogs. <laughs> like, well, that is perhaps the worst portrayal of the LGBTQ population in the world, but that is what the culture has shown them. So sort of bringing down those myths uh, for service for providers has been very good. And they come up with really good ideas because, uh, of course, they know their area of expertise better than anyone. So, for example, we have one person from the Ministry of Agriculture asking, like, how can we move the white men from the apartments out to the uh, rural areas of Colombia? It's like, well, let's start, let's start over. <laughs> but after they got rid of those prejudiced ideas, they had actually fantastic ideas for access to land, access to government official um, benefits, like economical benefits for working that land that I had no idea they existed. Of course, they know because they work at the Ministry of Agriculture. I had no idea, but I, what I do know is that not only gay men with small dogs in the cities should be your main concern when <laughs> concerning about LGBTQ issues. So, um, and then I went to the LGBTQ persons we know in the, in the, the areas that this ministry was working with, and we let them know that the state had this program and that is like the connection that we did. And then they started working on their own because what Colombia Diversa always says is we don't want to grow more because we don't need more Colombia Diversa. We need more people doing LGBTQ human rights work. And that means the official, like the state officials doing more work about these issues, but also LGBTQ grassroots organizations doing better work. So they don't waste their time and energy, which is already limited enough into doing, for example, asking questions to the wrong authority. They will be shut down, they will be devastated, and they will have wasted as like perhaps the most valuable thing for them, their most valuable resource, which is their time. Um, so if we let them know who are the best authorities to ask those four or two, then they have a better use of their time. And if we go and talk with those authorities or with the bosses of those authorities and let them know that it's not only about gay men with small dogs in the city, then that conversation can happen better. Um, that's what we found that works best. And what I would say about the, why do you work with trans women and not with cis women? <laughs> um, what I would say and what I have had to say in my own defense uh, before is, what do you mean? It is the same work. We're doing the same work. Um, helping them uplift your work. What we're doing is prioritizing uh, resources or time or whatever. But we're not doing different work, which I've said enough times already. <laughs> I've stopped there, but um, sort of making them, making those people realize that these are not separate agendas. Uh, that's helped me and finding that common ground. Well, we've gone over, but we have one more question. So, yeah, yeah. there's a question here in the chat for Dorian to leave, but I think okay. we should get the questions to the panel. Uh, so, Dorian's main question is about the experience of the panel 
in working with humanitarian actors who often have huge influence. And second, uh, she's interested in your thoughts on working in spaces where being LGBTQ plus is criminalized. Uh, okay, so I'll just say that I think this point about educate to me it's a, it is about education too. It's about um, the role of like it's everyone who's doing humanitarian emergencies response to like have some awareness and understanding of LGBTQ people's lived experiences, even if it is to know who to email who to contact yeah. and and i think that what i've seen is what i have seen is a lot of spinning around things that are um wanting to get all the language right and wanting to get all of it right before necessarily having a roster of contact lists which um i think now we can look at um work by edge effect and a number of organizations that have online trainings and and resources online that um absolutely understanding the limits of your your own knowledge and it is important but equally important is the responsibility to then have the colleagues and the contacts of those who do because it uh yeah because of reasons that susan has already talked about and also i do think that and and this in women peace and security i, I think straight cisgender women a lot of times i've seen um two things have kind of uh, stood in the way of doing more or being more accountable to this work. One is sort of what if there's transphobes and there are transphobes yeah. and queer and trans people and feminists are dealing with them all the time. So I, I, I always argue that's actually the reason to do it more. <laughs> um, not doing the work doesn't mean the transphobes aren't there. And then sort of like, well, I'm not part of that community. So what am I supposed to do? Which um, is a good question, but it's also your work to answer it. <laughs> so. I very simply do the work. Right? Um, it's as Susanna says, when you when if you do the work, it's not that hard. Um, and it, it's about we talk when the talk about making commitment, but I think it's also we also talk about the idea of like recognizing where you where the gaps are and then doing that work, right? And that's really hard. Um, you know, it's really hard and I do recognize especially humanitarian actors um, have to respond very quickly sometimes to certain situations. But I think that means that you need to have programming design that is that has done the work beforehand so you can respond. Mm -hmm. And quite often that's that's where the gap is, right? Um, and, and that's a that's a very, very good challenge, I think, for humanitarian actors to to be thinking through that and also to be thinking how do we make this a safe space sometimes when we say safe spaces i think the the vision can be quite myopic um but so i think querying querying that idea of a safe space we have actually quite a lot of that in the toolkit if you'd like to take a look at it um so so to, to do the work is all i would say really yeah and just to answer the part about work where being an lgbtq person is criminalized well of course you have to seek out for your own and the queer people's safety uh, first. Of course, you shouldn't do anything that puts people at risk or your own. Um, but also there are some like tricky ways, like we the queers are the champions of putting it out there without anyone else noticing. <laughs> um, there's, I'm not gonna get into that, but <laughs> I had a joke. <laughs> I'm gonna. Um, we can uh, convene under other uh, reasons. For example, I met one activist for their own security. I will not mention who or where, but uh, in one of these contexts, and what they did was they convened the meeting on their like uh, rehab reasons. Mm -hmm. So it held these standards of confidentiality and the police couldn't raid you or couldn't ask for uh, like a signature list or something. Uh, but they were just like doing queer plotting stuff, of course. <laughs> uh, so those, that kind of things you can do. Um, you can also, for example, find out, for example, if it's more beneficial or more risky to ask for more data. So in this context, for, for example, I wouldn't push for a census on LGBTQ persons, of course, 
But that is something that we've been pushing for in Colombia for so long. Like we need to know how many LGBTQ persons are and we need to know if they live under the poverty line or above it, if they have all small dogs. So we can just settle that, <laughs> that is a argument for forever <laughs> but um but under these circumstances of course i wouldn't but what you can do is you can find for example in this context some international cooperation allies of those same humanitarian actions uh, response to find another way to gather that information or to prioritize um better for example actions or safe keeping routes so and it's the same. This is queer coding. People, any literature scholar here? Queer coding. That's a whole thing. So you know Ursula from uh, The Little Mermaid. Like she's a trans woman. We all know it. <laughs> she's a, she's actually a drag queen. Uh, but of course Disney never said this. You can do that same thing, that queer coding thing, with everything. Um, and it could be, for example, I don't know, people under under special security concerns. Nobody needs to know it's about their sexual orientation or their gender identity. But if you the nation's office for human rights in this particular context or the Red Cross get into an agreement that that is how you're going to call it and that is how you're going to prioritize these issues. Well, that that's great. Like the government doesn't need to find out. Mm. Um, that would be the thing. But mostly I would uh, advocate for above all safety and avoiding risks and finding when you have the power to do so what is that key puzzle piece that you have to shift in order for this to change in the long term i know sometimes it seems like impossible but it always looks impossible before it happens so if you are in a position of privilege or in a position of supporting someone who is in a privileged position to change in the long, 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 long term the criminalization of LGBTQ persons, well, give it a try. If you're not putting yourself at direct risk, the worst thing that could happen is that it all remains the same, which is not worse than before. Um, of course, under like very specific conditions, I'm saying this, don't put yourself in harm's way, please. Yeah, and I'll just end on the queer and feminist collaboration because there was so much talk of it's uh, safer to do this work if we're not doing it alone. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think um, having that be a, a long term commitment and collaboration is a way to think of these different um, creative ways to continue doing the work rather than um, the idea, you know, falling into the this idea that, well, there aren't visible queer people, so it's not time yet. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't wait until it's time <laughs> in, in that way. So, um, yeah, I, I thanks everyone for coming today and thanks everyone for joining um, virtually. Um, I'm sorry to say that you virtually will not be able to join us for the reception afterwards. We have, um, we would like to welcome you to enjoy some refreshments and uh, <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining and please let us know what you think about our talk. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Thank you. Yes, thank you to the whole team that helped make this possible. Thank you.